environmental sensibilities as reflected in Vedic and classical Sanskrit literature. Environmental pollution is one of the serious problems that confront the world. The contribution of Sanskrit towards the protection of environment is tremendous. The world constitutes five elements, earth, water, air, fire and sky. Of these, the three elements, earth, water and air are prone to pollution while the rest remain unaffected. The pollution which disturbs ecological balance is called environmental pollution. In olden days, man as part and parcel of nature used to live harmoniously with it. He even treated the forces of nature as divine beings. Agni Deva, Varuna Deva, Vayu Deva and so on and glorified their existence and prayed for their intervention in nature's fury. But in the modern age, man partly out of necessity but mostly selfishly started industrial and other such activities. But soon his greed degenerated into avarice and drove him to excess. He indulged in the over exploitation of nature's bounties and began polluting natural elements in the name of development and modernization. The evils namely exploitation of natural resources, industrial pollution, deforestation and excessive use of chemicals have contributed to the environmental pollution as the present generation is a nexus between the past and future generation. It has a bounden duty to leave a good legacy to posterity. If the attitude of the modern man continues to be the same, the survival of humanity itself will become a big question. In fact, no country wishes to remain undeveloped. But the development should be healthy and at an affordable cost. It should not create obstacles in the healthy and prosperous development of future generations. So, in order to achieve sustainable development, one should give up one's greed and learn to live in peace with nature. This is how our ancestors, even in the Vedic, Vedic times, learned to live. Veda, the very first book of mankind, which is also considered to be the greatest treatise on environment, ensured a healthy relationship between man and nature. This relationship should be as uh, sacrosanct as between mother and child. The earth was looked upon as universal mother and all living beings uh, her children. Mata Prithvi Putroham Prithviya In Vedic times, rituals were encouraged and performed with a view to keeping the environment pure and perfect. The flora and fauna were considered to be the two important facets of Mother Nature. The Vedas have glorified the greenery and identified it with the divinity. According to Shastras, Plantation of saplings is a sacred dharma and the destruction of trees a great sin. All the points of Sanskrit literature 
with no exception are great lovers of nature they not only loved nature but also identified themselves with it there are many instances to highlight uh, the love of sanskrit poets uh, for flora and fauna in the second canto of raghuvamsha a line speaks to dilipa explaining the significance of a tree amum purappasya si devadaru putri prutoso rushabad bhajena yo hema kumbhastana nisrutanam skandasya matu payasam rasagnya okay the tree which you see yonder is a devadaru tree brought up by shiva like his own son his wife parvati nourished it by providing pots of water as she nourished her own son kumar swami with her breast milk here the motherly affection towards a tree is established moreover it is also said that once upon a time a wild elephant rubbed her cheek against this same tree rupturing the bark of the tree on seeing this parvati felt sad as if her own son kumar swami was wounded by arrows pointed at him by asuras harshavardhana when describing the hermitage of a saint in his magrama pas nagaranda describes that the trees in the hermitage are barked only superficially lest deep skinning should cause great pain to the trees from these anecdotes it is evident that in the vedic times even the smallest injury done to trees was seriously viewed and uh, resented in the kumar sambhava kalidasa went a step further by saying that even a poisonous tree should not be cut even by the person who raised it vishavrukshopi samvardhya svayam chetuma sampartam in abhijnana sakuntalam anasuya when conversing with sakuntala speaks to her jovially she said i think that our father sage kanwa must be having more love and affection for the trees of our hermitage than for you who though extremely delicate has been interested in the task of watering them then sekuntala replied that she had been watering the plants not merely because of her father's behest but because she was also having brotherly affection towards them it is very interesting to observe that every tree in the hermitage of kanwa offers ornaments to sekuntala at the time of departure to join her husband similarly the sage kanwa while sending sekuntala to her husband's house reminds the trees about the service rendered by her to them and seeks permission from each of the trees patun pradamam yavasyati jalam yushma swapite shuya nadatte priyamandana apibhavatam snehe naya pallavam adyeva kusuma prasuti samaye yasya bhavatyutsavah seyam yati sekuntala patigruham sarvairavijnan anujnayatam our culture went to the extent of saying that no loss of trees under any circumstances 
should be permitted. Even in extraordinary circumstances, the destruction of trees or plants should be compensated for. As an example, the loss of plants occurring for a cremation should be replenished by cultivating the same number of saplings by the person who performs the funeral rites. The plantation of trees is highly encouraged in our culture. One should raise big trees which bear fruits. Even if it does not offer fruits, it at least gives shadow. Sevitavyo maha vrukshaha halachaya samanvitaha edi daivak palam nasyat chaya kena nivaryate. The trees are compared with the great people who sacrifice their everything for the happiness of others. Chayam anyasya kurvanti tishthanti svaya matape palanyapi parardhaya prukshaha satpurushaiva which means they give shadow to others while standing themselves in the heat. Their fruits are also helpful for others. The trees are like the good people. Now, let us come to the other aspect of the environment that is Ona. It may evoke great interest to point out that all animals forgetting their identity used to live together in and around the hermitages of saints without mutual animosity. The sages also used to treat them as their children. The description of Vasishtha's hermitage in the Raghuvamsya establishes a sort of mother-child intimacy between man and animal. The hermitage of Vasishtha was littered with deeds which were so eager for their fodder that they almost blocked the waves of the her hermits carrying grains inside them. Please find the mental agony of a poor animal which is caught and taken by a hunter. Oh my dear hunter, you cut and take away every part of my body, but spare my udder because my newly born babies being unable to eat even tender grass waiting anxiously for me staring at the direction of which I have come. If I don't feed them, they will die. Please be kind enough to leave me. The indiscriminate killing of animals for food and export, scientific experiments, preparing medicinal portions and cosmetic purposes may disturb the ecological balance. Once in China, farmers killed all the sparrows, opining that they would consume 5% of food grains. But to their surprise, they witnessed 12% loss of food grains because sparrows, though consume some amount of grains, protect the crop by eating away the harmful pests which cause more damage to them. The messages such as non-violence is the supreme dharma, let not all animals be killed are found in the Vedas which advocate non-violence. In our culture, every creature in nature has been treated and worshipped as a divine being and even venomous serpents are treated as gods and worshipped. Earth From Vedic times till date, we regard the earth not as a mere natural object but as a loving mother who sustains all, thing, all beings. Similarly, earth has many treasures in her womb, yielding not only agricultural products 
but also mines of gold and other material. But over exploitation of natural resources is a serious offence. Earth can satisfy our need, but not our greed. Earth will never tolerate when it is being exploited beyond certain limits. The story in the Mahabharata indicates this. Once Karna was roaming in his kingdom on a chariot. At that time, a girl who was walking with a bowl full of oil in her hand saw him passing nearby. Fascinated by his charm, she stared at him. The bowl in her hand fell on the ground and the oil sank into it. The girl, while weeping, insisted Karna to get back the oil. Karna squeezed the sand and he could get 50% of oil. The girl again insisted Karna to squeeze more. Karna squeezed the oil and could get 80% of oil. Again, the girl insisted him to get more. Karna tried. It gave vent to her anger and Bhudevi cursed Karna. She said, When you are fighting with your enemy, the wheel of your chariot will sink into the ground and you will also be killed by your enemy. This story reveals that even the nature cannot tolerate exploitation up to some extent, can tolerate exploitation up to some extent not beyond. Water. Water plays a vital role in human life. There are hundreds of Vedic mantras which reveals the importance of water. Water is called Jivanam in Sanskrit. Jivanam means life. It is a drink of immortality. We depend upon food for our living and for production of food, agriculture is necessary and agriculture depends upon water. Our culture went to the extent of saying that polluting water is a great sin. In the Ramayana, Bharata says to Kausalya, the mother of Rama, O oh mother, if I have any mal intention of sending Rama to exile, I will definitely go to that hell a man goes on polluting drinking water. Because of this water pollution, we are in a miserable condition of purchasing drinking water. A. There are hundreds of Vedic hymns which describe the glory of A. They recognize the importance of pure and unpolluted air for the source of health, happiness and long life. We should never forget that every oxygen molecule we breathe is definitely a product of a particular tree of a particular period. The air is praised as the supreme deity. Namaste Vayo Tameva Prichaksham Brahma Vameva Prichaksham Brahma Vadishyami Rutam Vadishyami Satcham Vadishyami Tanma Mavatu Tad Vaktara Mavatu Avatumam Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti 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 In many areas in our country, air is also polluted due to industrial industries and uh, excessive use of chemicals and a stage may come shortly that ever one should purchase fresh air uh, for such means. Similarly, there are many types of pollutions such as uh, sound pollution, mind pollution, heart pollution etc. Heart pollution is the root cause of all the other pollutions and it can be rectified uh, through the practice of ethical code available in the moral branches of sciences and yoga. From time immemorial, 
the bond between man and nature has been extremely strong. Now, it is our bounden duty and the sublime obligation to maintain the equilibrium and see that nature is not disturbed or interfered with. Lest it should lead to chaos and confusion, as aptly pointed out by Ernest Hemingway, the famous American novelist, who said, Mending nature is ending nature. It would be great service to nature if environmentalists and uh, other <coughs> academicians contribute their share in preventing further environmental pollution. In this connection, advise uh, all to encourage plantation of trees and uh, discourage using polythene covers. You make this a point uh, and continue it as a movement. Let uh, the following uh, American saying bring some change in our minds of the people. Only after the last tree has been cut down, only after the last fish has been caught, only after the last uh, river has been poisoned, only then will you realize that money cannot be eaten. A native American saying. I will, I will conclude with a chant of a hymn from the Ayurveda. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Let all the Lokas be happy. Loka Samastaha Sukhrava Bhavati. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.